Chapter 3 Bradley was going to turn three years old in a couple of months. He had been potty trained and could feed himself if Natalie left food out. Things like cereal and milk, crackers, or pudding. But there was often a mess when she came home from work or evenings out, and she would scold him sharply. I want my baby to be perfect, she would tell her friends or co-workers. Bradley knew he would get punished if he made a mess, so he would try not to eat. He was underweight for his age and often hungry. Mo got out of jail again and came to sweep Natalie off her feet. The first thing he did was borrow a few dollars from Manny. I missed you so bad, baby, you and our boy. Let's go to the beach and enjoy ourselves. He took his joyful wife and Bradley to Long Beach. They put out a blanket on the sand near a public restroom, and Mo broke out the beers. Bradley had a little plastic bucket and shovel, and Mo tried to teach him how to make sandcastles. The happy parents lit cigarettes, mixing the smell of burning tobacco into the salty sea air that Bradley breathed. While his parents smoked and cracked open beer cans, Bradley sat and dug a hole near the blanket. After a while, the hole was pretty deep. Hey, son, you trying to dig your way to China? asked Mo. Ha 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 ha! Bradley laughed. He was shy for many hours of being left alone and didn't know what else to say. Mo puffed his chest out with pride at his nice family. The three of them attracted stares or greetings from everyone who walked by. Hi there, nice day out, huh? said a muscular young man, wet from a dip in the ocean and on his way to the restroom. Hey, partner, it sure is. How you doing? Mo said. He called everyone partner. It was weird, but Natalie liked it. Just fine, thanks. As the man walked by, he took a look at the family, especially Natalie, his eyes lingering over the curves of her body in a tight nylon one-piece bathing suit. Natalie was sure he didn't mean to be rude. He just couldn't help it. Mo watched the man enter the public toilet and gulp down the rest of his beer. They had finished off a six-pack already. Did you see that son of a bitch look you all over like that? Mo said to Natalie in a low voice. For her part, Natalie was used to being stared at and didn't mind the attention. Few men could keep their eyes off of her. If she could have withstood the initial rejections, she likely would have landed a modeling job, even after delivering the baby. But her immediate reaction to rejection was to move on. And here she was, supporting Mo and the baby with her wages and tips from waitressing at Shakey's. <laughs> Honey, they all do. Get used to it, she said, giggling playfully to lighten Mo up. Nah, said Mo. He could see there's a man here with you. That shit is disrespectful. Mo stood up on the blanket, looked around carefully, then walked across to the sand and into the restroom. Natalie heard low voices for a few moments. No, oh, man, I didn't mean that, the man said, his voice reverberating through the bathroom and pitched with fear. It seemed very odd because the man was almost as tall as Mo and had much bigger muscles. Then she heard a loud whack, like the sound of an axe striking a piece of hardwood. Then came thuds, the sound of a head slamming against a concrete wall. Mo came sauntering out of the doorway, rubbing his knuckles. I sucker punched the punk with my famous right hook. She would hear him brag at a party the next night. What happened? I could hear that dude say he was sorry, Natalie asked, suddenly afraid of what Mo could do when he got angry. Come on, honey, let's get out of here before Bradley digs us into that hole, Mo said. His voice was calm and reassuring. Grab the blanket. Come on, son. Mo scooped up Bradley with his left arm. The boy grabbed his plastic bucket but dropped the little shovel into the hole, and Mo didn't stop to pick it up. They looked like a happy family going home from a sunny day at the beach, except for Bradley, who started kicking and struggling until Mo put him down. Give me your hand, son. Bradley allowed Mo to hold his hand while walking. Mom might punish him if he didn't obey. Mo was careful behind the wheel. He never got a ticket, no matter how many beers he'd knocked back. Natalie watched him drive home and thought about what happened to the bodybuilder back at the beach, feeling very safe with him. Due to his jail time, the couple had only spent a few months together in the three years since their wedding. But when Mo was around, he was charming and good with Bradley. She believed they would have a sunny future, but the sun was not yet shining on good fortune. When they arrived home, Mo settled in front of the TV. Natalie indulged in her habit of taking care of the stray cats. She kept a bowl of friskies outside the back door, and when one came to eat, she would coax it inside where she would talk to it gently like it was a child and brush its fur over and over. Come and pet the nice kitty, Bradley, she would say. Sometimes Bradley would close his eyes and imagine she was talking to him instead of the cat. 
If he didn't stop whatever he was doing and come and pet the cat, she would scold him until his ears burned. He was always expected to do everything right, and if not, he was in trouble. You have to be perfect, she would coo to him softly, as if it excused her from yelling. Watching her spoil the cats made an unexpected gift. While Natalie rarely touched her son other than to discipline him or help him with his clothes, her care for the stray cats taught him to love and respect living things. The fast-paced work at Shakey's was hard on Natalie, who tried to get the day shift but often had to work nights and weekends. She sometimes blamed Bradley for the fact that she hadn't found a career as a model. Mo was still between jobs, but Natalie kept faith that his luck would turn. After all, he had all kinds of plans and talked like they were a sure thing. He could be a truck driver. There was a school on Wilshire Boulevard where he could learn to fix televisions. His father, who had died a few years ago from hard living, had taught him to be a welder. Mo didn't care for pizza or crowded restaurants, which was fortunate for the customers that flirted with Natalie. If he'd seen them ignoring her wedding ring and telling her that such a pretty girl shouldn't be working in a restaurant, it would have likely been mayhem or murder. One very busy Friday evening, Natalie served a pizza-loving gentleman in a tailored suit. After a couple of beers, the large man pointed at his shiny new car out in the parking lot and told her that if she were his wife, she'd never have to work again. That night, she confronted Mo. Morris? Said Natalie, her voice filled with tension. What, baby? Asked Mo. How was your day? Come here, let me hug you all up. He could sense her anxiety and knew how to fix it. Holding her gently, he caressed her back and slowly swept a big hand over the curves of her body. Natalie felt herself soften and began to forget the problem. No, she had to say it. When are you going to bring home a paycheck, honey? She asked. Don't worry about that now. I have something coming up. You know I want to take care of you and our boy. You keep saying that, Mo. Damn it. You keep on saying that. When is it going to happen? When am I going to get some help with these bills? She ended loudly and leaned her face toward his, her finely penciled eyebrows furrowing. Mo pulled away and began pacing, jaw clenched, the muscles in his cheeks twitching. He stared out a window. He started to say something he might regret, but caught himself. He then glared at Bradley, who was playing with building blocks on the floor of the small living room. A kitchenette and two tiny bedrooms, barely big enough for double beds, completed the place they had been sharing with Annie, who lately was rarely home. Bradley felt scared, picked up the blocks, and went to Annie's bedroom where he could feel safe. Damn it to hell, Mo said. You want it all nice, don't you? It came out as a shout that reverberated off the walls. Well, yeah. She thought to tease him about the rich customer who wanted to date her, then remembered him beating up the muscle man at the beach. But she needed him to bring home some money. I'm gonna take care of this shit, baby. God is my witness in all my father's grave, he said, waving his fist through the air. He turned suddenly and came toward her, and she shrunk back into the cushions of the couch. Afraid he was going to hit her, she gave him the final say. Mo went out one night to meet Natalie's cousin, Shu, the man who had stood up for them at their wedding. Shu had been to the apartment a couple of times before Annie banned him for getting his hands up under her dress after a few shots of Johnny Walker. Annie had boundaries, and so did Shu, at least when it came to Natalie. He would never touch Nat, despite their history as kissing cousins. The men had mutual respect in that regard. Besides, Shu had a girl of his own, but she never wanted to go out, so she stayed home with their baby. Shu would come by when Annie was out to see Mo and bring a big bottle of brown liquid he called Shine. Sometimes he brought over pills for Natalie that would knock her out so he could go out on the town with Mo and not get yelled at. Mo brought Shu over one night after Bradley was in bed on his little mattress in the corner of the living room. They walked right by him in the dark and tried to be quiet. Then they went into the bedroom where Natalie was sleeping, turned the light on, and closed the door. Bradley could hear their words getting faster, their voices getting louder. Natalie didn't mind getting awakened in the middle of the night if something fun was happening. She was always open to excitement. Mo and Shu were telling her they had a play ready, and in 24 hours all their money problems would be over. They wouldn't tell her details, though. If somebody came around asking questions, they didn't want her to know anything. Trust me, baby. Trust me and my partner, Mo was saying over and over. We're going to make this happen. Shu went to lay on Annie's bed, and Mo and Natalie got quiet. An alarm clock buzzed a few hours later and woke everybody up. It was still dark outside. Bradley heard whispers and the toilet flushing. Mo and Shu went out the door into the night, and Natalie went to check on her son. 
You awake, honey? Sorry about all this. I love you, Bradley, she said, kissing him on the forehead. Her eyes were shining in the moonlight, and she seemed happy. She always looked happy when something exciting was going to happen. Shu came by three days later with bad news. Mo was in jail. Shu had waited three days because the man had been watching the apartment. Anybody in authority, especially police or detectives, was the man to Mo and his partner. Life was always about them against the man, he would tell Bradley. Natalie screamed at him when she heard the news and started throwing kitchen utensils at him. She kicked Shu out of the house and ordered him to never come back. It was after that that she took her wedding ring off. The young mother and wife of a jailbird bustled about the pizza restaurant on a busy weekday evening. She spotted a table with a lone male patron and honed it. Single men always gave better tips. Hey, honey, remember me? Said the handsome man with the big shiny car parked outside. How have you been? She did remember. Things could be better, but I'm here. What can I get you? She rested her hands on the edge of the table so he could see there was no wedding ring. How about a cup of coffee and your phone number to start, he said. I get off at nine, and I'd love to take a ride in your car. She blurted it out before she could think twice about it. It wasn't like her to be so direct. But being broke with a husband in jail had a way of messing with the girl's mind. The man was caught off guard and was left temporarily speechless. I will like that double fine. She had a steamy cup of coffee at his table in no time. Here you are, sir, she said. On the house. He looked at his watch. I have a business meeting. I should be here around 9.15. Natalie watched him sip the coffee, stand up, drop a 10 spot on the table, and saunter out. Natalie had the man's heart racing and his stomach so tied in knots that he couldn't order any food. Three hours later, he pulled up right at 9.15. Natalie had punched her time card and was standing outside, smoking. She wasn't sure if she should walk up to the car or let him come to her. She tossed her cigarette and they met in the middle. Can I give you a hug, honey? Sure, said Natalie. It was awkward. He was fat, and she felt his big belly press against her when he pulled her in. He walked over to the blue Cadillac and opened the door for her. Then he drove her a mile away to his hotel room where he was staying on a business trip from San Diego. The first thing that came out was a bottle of rum. He had a bucket of ice and chocolates on a little table by the bed. Soft music was playing on the radio. Wow, how nice of you to do all this for me she said. She was thinking of a better life, of a yard with a lawn and a washing machine, and of staying home while her fat new husband with the big shiny car worked and made lots of money. How long have you been waitressing at Shakey's, honey? He asked. By the way, my name is Mike. A few years, off and on. I tried to get a modeling job. I still might, she said, and began rambling on about Annie and the two of them going around in Hollywood. The iced rum hit her quickly. She was tired of Mo's bullshit and could have let him rot in jail. She liked this man, who had a big car and could afford a $10 tip. And he was so damn nice. It didn't take long until the two of them were stretched out on the bed. Mike was a good kisser. Natalie overlooked his rolls of fat and took her clothes off. She knew what he wanted, and she wanted him to have it if it meant she could have a better life. They screwed, figuring out as they went how to do it so his big body wouldn't hurt her. After they finished, she got dressed. He put his boxers back on and lay there in his underwear. Honey, it was so nice to see you in private, he said, giving her a fiver for cab fare. Thank you, she said, suddenly feeling sad and lost. Will I see you back at Shakey's sometime? Oh, yes, you will. Next time I'm up here for business. Bye, honey. She let herself out, walked the mile back to Shakey's, and had a cup of coffee. Mike had made her feel good about herself, like she was needed. An hour or so later, she went home, where Bradley was wandering around, anxious, alone, and hungry. Three months later, her belly swollen, she went to the doctor who said she was pregnant. She wanted to tell Mike the news, but for whatever reason, he never dined at that Shakey's Pizza again. Once again, Mo got out of jail right before Natalie was due to deliver, but this time he was there when she went into labor and he put Bradley in the back seat for a wild ride to the hospital where she delivered a healthy baby boy. She almost named him Mike, which was the sort of thing her mother had done for two of her siblings, depending on which drunken story you believed. If Mike ever showed up at Shakey's again, she would have to tell him that he was the father of her second son, and he would be as good as dead. Mo could piece together the truth from the smallest shred of evidence and usually be right. Natalie named her second baby Jeffrey. They never discussed it, 
but it was understood Jeffrey wasn't Mo's kid. When it came down to it, her husband couldn't have cared what she named him. He was wrestling with enough inner demons. As long as Jeffrey's real father was out of sight, he could stay out of Mo's mind. The recent jail time and the new baby seemed to anchor Mo. He had good intentions and was naturally clever when he could control the bottle. Noticing that everybody seemed to have a TV, but nobody knew how to fix them, he signed up for a TV repair course, which even provided a loan to pay for tuition. Bradley would walk around and watch him sitting at the kitchen table, studying diagrams and writing out electrical circuits. Natalie was breastfeeding Jeffrey, her hopes up again that they could be a normal family. But Annie was frustrated with so many people in her little place. She announced that they had to leave as soon as Morris got paid. Mo finished the course and started a TV repair job, going in every day from nine to five. He hated working all day, every day, but he did it for Natalie and the boys. There were still his needs and cravings, his itches to scratch. My demons, he called them. When he finally got a paycheck, most of which was promised to pay back loans and cover their share of the rent, Mo took Natalie and Annie out for a big celebration and spent nearly all of it. When Mo's next checks came in, Natalie grabbed money as soon as he cashed them and put together a deposit and first month's rent for a little cottage across town in Pacoima. It wasn't any bigger than Annie's apartment, but it was their own place. Bradley was getting old enough for kindergarten, and a good school was nearby. But with two kids and Nanny not around to babysit, Natalie had to quit her job at Shakey's. With Mo on the straight and narrow, maybe her dream of being a stay-at-home mom would finally come true.